Well, shall we get into the uh, the Farcaster explosion uh, charting this week? I believe beating WeChat. Um, why is why and how is Farcaster blowing up? And will you finally concede that it is blowing up? Yeah, well, I mean, we're we're kind of past the blow up phase. So, okay. I mean, the, the challenge of a podcast where you you record once a week and <laughs> you know you do recording on a yeah. uh, you know an interview one. I, I think so. Where where did we start the year? I kind of gave like some you know, sober take of where Farcaster was. And then I got a bunch of uh, <laughs> feedback on Farcaster that I'm too negative and I should be more of a hype guy. And then I think it was like a week later or two weeks later, we launched Frames, which I think I gave a little bit of a preview uh, when that was happening. Antonio was excited about it. Uh, but look, we got like three weeks of insane growth. Uh, the, the number that's most important is we we 10 x the number of active people using the protocol every day. And that, that mostly has sustained. I think it's come down a bit. And I would imagine it'll still decline a little bit. Like everything in social is like day 30. And so we're still, you know, uh, just coming up on 30 days of frames. But a lot of the growth happened kind of a week or two after. So I think we will be in a much better place than we were in terms of like, I mean, anytime you 10 X the the size of whatever you're doing in a very short period of time, some stuff breaks, but also at the same time, like you're actually just at a new, by, by definition, new order of magnitude, but it, it's a, it's a step function. It's a, um, the only other comparable I have is when in Coinbase went through growth in 2017, we had a series of step function changes over the course of the year, right? Like we, we actually went into the year optimistic because we had finished 2016 strong. And then this is Coinbase. And then, you know, we kind of had like very good first quarter. And then the second quarter, like I remember it was like April was a dip compared to March. And so we were like, oh, maybe this isn't going to sustain. And then May and June were insane. And like, I think like June, we made like 50 million in revenue in a month. And we just thought, oh my God, like this is amazing. And I think the end of the year, that December is when we peaked and it was like closer to like 350 million in a month wow. in December. <laughs> so I think if, if I use that as a reference point, um, it's hard to know how these, you can think of it as like a series of S curves, right? Like you, you kind of go from a spot, you have an insane growth and then it kind of plateaus and then you kind of tie all those together. And, and in the micro, you actually can see those S curves, but in the macro, obviously you just see the, the massive amount of growth. But I don't think like when people say hockey stick, um, you're kind of taking that exponential curve and, and, and looking at it at like a zoomed out view when the reality is anytime you actually look at the day to day, um, there's a decent amount of variation. Uh, but I think where I'm excited is like Farcaster's in like a new phase where there's a lot more awareness. And I think that the, the thesis that we've had or like, the hypothesis, I guess, um, was that if we could attract more users of the protocol, we would attract more developers. And that was the case with Frames with maybe a little bit of a critique on that in that Frames actually was a developer phenomenon that attracted users, which attracted more developers. And so uh, I'm, I'm optimistic because I think that there's still a lot of energy around Frames and developers, and we're about to launch transactions this week. Um, so the way to think about that is Frames to date, they're somewhat static. Like you can do a little bit of interactivity, and people have been really creative with it, but the fundamental like frame interaction doesn't involve like a crypto wallet. Um, you can get crypto into a wallet, so you can click a button and have someone like drop airdrop an air, NFT into your wallet because that, that data is all available. But the ability for you to initiate a crypto transaction directly from a frame hasn't existed yet, and so we are going to have that this week. Maybe maybe it slips into next week. But the uh, the way to think about that is basically any developer, if they want to do anything on a blockchain, can use a frame as the launching point to kind of have you go do that. Now, there's a security implication of that. Um, obviously, you just don't want to do any arbitrary uh, thing on a blockchain. And uh, like a story, and I don't even know if I showed it, shared it on the pod, my Twitter got hacked in the yeah. fall. And we actually have a mutual friend who ended up losing a bunch of money because they trusted it was a link from me when it was from yeah. a hacker and um, you click, you connect your wallet. And then as soon as you kind of connect to that page, what you're actually doing behind the scenes or that transaction 
um, is you're just giving them like full access to your wallet so they can like drain all of the assets from it. Um, the security of wallets is getting a lot better. So I think a lot of that stuff is just going to go away because now wallets are building in. It's almost like that Windows era with like antivirus with like you, you scan your attachments and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so for the Zoomers, like they probably don't know what that is because they've never actually used like a, a PC. Uh, but, you know, we all remember like, okay, don't click on random files because you get a virus or, you know, something worse on your computer. And uh, that's still very much the era of where we are with crypto wallets. And so I think one of the things that we have to be thoughtful about, and I think the team has a pretty good iterative approach, is making sure that when you just click on any arbitrary link in your feed, that's then sending, like saying, hey, initiate this transaction on Ethereum or, or Solana or wherever it's going to be, um, that you're not giving your keys of the kingdom. Uh, and so, so I, I think it'll be iterative. I'm sure we'll have something bad happen at some point. It's just like inevitable. Um, but we're going to do our best to try to minimize that and you know, be reactive when, when it does happen of like, how can we make sure that that specific vector doesn't happen yeah. again? But what's exciting is then it just, it gives developers even more freedom to create new experiences, right? And so if you're, if you're building in crypto, uh, the ability to kind of surface something that you can do on a blockchain in a very easy to understand consumer-friendly way in an app that they're already using is a new experience. And so that I think is, that's, that's an exciting part. And, and so I think for us, one way to think about it is like Farcaster has the ball and like we just got to keep moving down the field with it. Like you can't, you can't fumble it. You can't like get distracted, no side quests. Um, and yeah, so I think we just need to be like laser focused on getting developers what they want and then um, continuing to build a great experience for users. And say more about why this growth is happening. Is, is it hundred percent product led? Like, were there any channels that, that have worked? Is it just because you opened it up and there's been this pent up demand? Has it surprised you or, or, or say more about that? Yeah, I think, it's it's hard because there's a bunch of con you, you can't isolate and then figure out exactly what it is. I think if I could simplify, we stayed focused last year on trying to drive um, the the core product Warpcast. So Warpcast is the client, and then there's the protocol Farcaster. We we decentralized Farcaster last year. I think that gave us a little bit of a, a tailwind, like just because like the actual network is decentralized. It's not like a coming soon thing. But but fundamentally, the growth has been driven by our execution or you know the set of things that we've done on on Warpcast. And so I think we we got really focused as a team, starting in kind of like mid to late October after we had gotten the network to permissionless, which had just been this like year and a half long, you know, technical. And you can explain for the audience exactly what that means, like te technically. Yeah. So so the way to think about it is for Farcaster started working on it in you know 2020. Uh, started onboarding the first people in the summer of 2021. Every user that was on Farcaster, the protocol, I more or less onboarded. There were some people who got invites and were able to, but you can say it's like 85% of the network came through either a Zoom call with me or then later, like they DM'd me on Twitter and my Twitter inbox is just like a mess. But, you know, that, that's how I did the onboarding. So it was a pretty curated, slow growth approach for the first couple of years. Um, partially that we thought it was just like a good way to like kind of set the initial community. But I also think that there's a component of like the underlying technology to like make Farcaster work as a protocol like email, right? Easy to make a centralized version of a Twitter clone, very hard to make a um, decentralized one that actually works, right? And, um, you know, basically the only one that's actually decentralized, there are two, uh, there is Mastodon, which has existed for a while, and then um, Noster, which is a kind of like Bitcoin centric. It's, it actually doesn't have anything to do with crypto specifically, like uh, like Bitcoin. It's just like the the ethos and the community of people interested in it. So those are two that are actually decentralized from an architecture standpoint. Uh, Blue Sky has a coming soon. I, I I think that's a very credible team, so they will deliver on that. But like until you do it, like you're just a science experiment on on that side of things. Uh, and then there are a couple others in crypto that I think the tech is probably there. They just haven't gotten around to doing the kind of permissionless part. And the permissionless part is hard because in a world where you don't have the ability to like moderate what users come in, you're going to be overwhelmed with spam if you don't actually have a solution for that. And so what Farcaster, you know, there's a variety of different things we've done, uh, but the, the, 
primary thing that we do is we charge a fee to sign up. So once we went to kind of like we flipped the switch in October of last year, we allowed anyone they didn't have to use our app. They could, you know, if they're technical enough, they could use the directly the the smart contract on Ethereum and then, you know, just like build their own client or whatever. So you could programmatically create accounts, but we started actually with a price of every account had to pay $12 and they paid it to a smart contract with some amount of crypto. So naturally you didn't have a ton of spam sign up because it's very expensive, right? Um, and then we've slowly reduced the price as we felt confident that we weren't going to be overrun with spam. And we've settled right now at least at $3 per user to sign up. Um, and so that is the biggest like driver of just like preventing the network from getting flooded. If you went to free, you would be overwhelmed with spam, you know, pornographic material, like all the worst types of stuff. People would just do it because they could because it was free. Um, so team took a really long time to kind of figure out how to do that and also just like make the technical stuff work in an actual decentralized way. And there's still a lot of work to do there, by the way. Like one of the things you have when you have 10x growth in a very short period of time is we found all the areas that needed to be scaled, both within like our app, but also at the, at the protocol. So like the team has been working really hard to do that and has made great progress in a very short period of time. But um, I, so I think that that was important to set the stage for frames. I think if we had launched frames pre-permissionless, I don't think, and the reason that's important is developers feel like they can't get rugged, right? Like now it's like, oh, I actually don't have to trust that core team. Like I, I trust that the technology that has been put on a blockchain and is open source, I, I can go view all that source code and, and, and get to a level of confidence. Um, so I think that that created developer trust, but it didn't really drive user growth. And then so I think we were very focused in November, December, in, in early January on just like driving new features in Warpcast, our, our app, to try to continue to drive growth. And I think we had like a few good weeks, but nothing like extraordinary. And I think when we launched Frames, we had kind of a some momentum just generally. And I think what it hit a nerve with, though, is our early community, those people I um, you know, curated essentially to get on the network, and plenty of them are cold inbound, uh, were very developer heavy. And that was actually a huge critique of Farcaster, I think up until recently, it was like, oh, it's just a bunch of devs and like, you know, Ethereum nerds. And it's like, this can never go mainstream, which very well could still be the case. Like you could just say, okay, we we increase the number of people interested, but we haven't really broken out of the crypto bubble. But when you launch something like Frames, which is simple and gives developers full creative freedom. And I think an important thing is we we haven't nerfed links. Like, so there's this whole meta, you know, our friend Mike Solana loves to talk about this, but basically this had already existed pre pre you know Elon, and I think in the Elon regime, it's only gotten kind of worse. Is basically the algo was optimizing for time spent within Twitter, and so Twitter, which I think the reason Twitter was so powerful relative to the other networks like Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, is if you have a piece of creative work or a company sharing a link on Twitter was getting you distribution, right, and you could go viral. And so in a world where the algorithm on Twitter does not favor links, you get a huge reduction in distribution, um, that, that's an opportunity. And so I think in a world where it, a frame is just a link, like that, that, that's like the core of it. So you could actually share the same thing on Twitter and it would just look like a boring link. It wouldn't have the interactivity, but more importantly, you would actually just lose the distribution. And, and on Farcaster, we, we don't penalize that. And that's, that's because we have Warpcast and so we've made that decision. And so I think that the kind of like, the stage was set correctly for launching this. And it's one of these things in startups where it, timing is everything and you kind of hit, you hit the right time and then you just kind of ride that uh, for growth. But I think we're probably at the tail end of that S curve on the, on the first, you know, big bump as a result of frames, but it's, it was a big enough bump that now I think we have, there's just like a lot more stuff we can go experiment with because we have 10 X the, the user base to kind of go play around with. and and so. I'm optimistic and, and I think that there's like a lot of stuff we can do with frames, but also there's a lot of other product stuff that I think the team is thinking about and, and we'll probably explore over the next couple of months. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. 
That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash turpentine. That's netsuite.com slash turpentine to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash turpentine. Give, give us a little bit of preview. What, what are you curious to, uh, or excited to experiment about or what, what are you curious to explore? The feature that we have that we have a lot of confidence in that's not frames is this concept of channels, which there is an MOZ channel on, on Farcaster. And the best way to think about it is it's kind of like a, like a subreddit. And if you're not a Redditor, almost like a mailing list or, uh, you know, Discord, if that's your, your cup of tea, like, you know, wherever you would find like a community of people. So beyond maybe just a group chat. Um, so if you're, a, you know, a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, it's like, where do you find other Cleveland Cavaliers fans on the internet? That's, that's basically what a channel allows you to do. And it's like, it's kind of like a narrow topic specific community, but it integrates in with the kind of like core feed. And so Twitter's actually tried this. They've had uh, multiple different products, one called Communities, which I think they still have. They had another one called Circles. And I think it's always just been challenging for Twitter because the modality set in there so early and, and compounded for so long that people are just used to like, I just post. And hashtags in theory would work, but they've always been super spammy. And so I think one of the the nice things about being early in your social network development is you you can actually introduce new primitives before everything is completely set in stone. And so I think channels we we put in place last year, and as a result of all the growth, like you can kind of view it as like come for the frames, stay for the yeah. channels is like maybe a little bit of like what we believe could could work. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do for channels. They're not um, they're not decentralized actually. So the content itself is decentralized, like the rest of the network is today. But you can naturally imagine if it's a smaller space and it's a topic specific space. In order for that to be high quality, you need some amount of curation, moderation, and so a lot of those features we've actually been implementing kind of very quickly through like our app, but not the rest of the network. And so I think we need to do the work to actually get it to be decentralized and. The challenge with that is twofold. One, it just always is a lot of work to properly decentralize something because it's a little bit of a measure twice, cut once, where once you've decentralized and really put it into a protocol, it gets a lot harder to unwind a bad decision. So you kind of have to game out like all the different ways, like, okay, well, when we do this, like, you know, will this actually get to the, the outcome we want? And then the second thing is it's just really, really difficult, like once it's out there, to change it. and 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 so we kind of have an opportunity to get the, the core part of the feature nailed in a centralized way and then, and then push it into the protocol. And I think that is something, this is a trade-off, right? Because if you go spend the time to decentralize it, you're actually spending more time taking the existing features and then thinking properly how to do that versus actually coming up with new features. And I think if you ask any developer in the Farcaster community, you know, 95% of them would rather have us grow the network by 10x or 100x or 1000x over the next 12 to 18 months and, and maybe don't don't focus on some of that. But so I, I think there's a balance because I think the longer we keep certain aspects centralized, uh, you lose credibility from like the kind of like, hey, this is actually a protocol. Like it's like, yeah, there are parts that are the protocol, but there are also parts that are centralized. So yeah, that, that's the and that's the challenge of it's like walking and chewing gum at the same time is the, you know, classic phrase, but like we, we have two, two things that are sub product market fit, right? It's like we have an app and we have a protocol and we need to kind of like balance the app drives growth for the most part. And the protocol is, I think the long-term compounding thing that will, will attract and keep developers over time. Yeah. And I just want to comment and say that channels are the feature that has hooked me to Farcaster. So I was one of your, you know, early Zoom calls as a as a friend, and and I was like, oh, this this is cool. But uh, you know, implicitly or or sort of what came to be was, hey, I've spent a lot of time over the last you know decade building my Twitter audience, and so there wasn't like a automatic need for me to come to Farcaster, especially not as a developer or an Ethereum person or or someone full time in crypto. And so I would check it from time to time, and you know, I, I appreciated the the community, but I wasn't like a a daily active. But in the last few months, even. 
or as soon as you started the Moment of Zen channel, I basically got hooked because I want to see what people are, 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 are saying about Moment of Zen. And then I checked up. Now I'm on like 10 different channels that I check every day. I check the podcast channel. I check the Nick's channel. There's, there's a few other ones. And I'm just like, wow, I can't believe Twitter didn't figure this out. Like, I can't believe Twitter didn't copy your, 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 your format. Just have the channels above the Williams, the ones I subscribe to. Yeah, look, I, I think at some point they'll probably do it. Like, they're, they're I, I think anyone underestimating Twitter, that's just like, that's cope. And not that you are, I just, yeah. I got a lot of people on Farcaster who love dumping on Twitter. And I'm like, no, I have deep respect for this product. Like, yeah, one, yeah. like, I, like, you know, and I think that that team is moving very fast. So my sense is that will get copied at some point. I actually expect frames at some point will get copied. Probably not in the crypto native way, but it'll, it'll like the interactivity. So I, I think we can only succeed in just continuing to move really fast and, and you know, delighting people and, and building products that people want both in, in our like app, but as also at the protocol. And I think what, what's interesting, like, I think the MOZ channel, for example, is like, best way to describe it is like the YouTube comments, but, you know, 10 to 30 IQ points higher um, <laughs> than, you know, uh, RIP YouTube comments for this episode. But I think like generally, you know, people have like a real identity associated with it for the most part, or even if it's in a non-identity, there's like social credibility. And so your ability to kind of like, you know, throw one from the cheap seats from whatever that weird username is on YouTube versus like actually kind of having people then be able to look through your posts and see what, yeah. you know, <laughs> dumb takes you might have. And so I think that is just like a higher quality experience. And so one vision I have is like at some point, if we can get the the UX really great, is like every you, every podcast should just like have a channel. Totally. And that's where the people have the conversation. And I know Substack has tried this version, but I think that the challenge is in all of those cases, very few apps can actually attract people to show up and open up the app every day. And I think where we are now with Farcaster and, and our app Warpcast is we have a, a decent sized community of people who, who open up the app every day. That's the only thing that matters. And so in that world, that can actually be a compounding for a lot of other things. And to your point, I think a lot of people have shown up specifically for the crypto content. Um, and then because of channels, they're, they're able to, you know, they contain multitudes, right? And, yeah. and so they, like, if you're into gardening or F1 racing or parenting or whatever topic, this is an area to find other like-minded people. You can ask a question in the parenting channel and, and you get like pretty high quality responses very quickly. I think Reddit is a much slower medium, right? It's like you have to usually use it. It's, it, it's not designed, it's designed fine to consume on mobile, but to create on Reddit is very desktop oriented in, in terms of my own experience. Um, and I'm not like a power Redditor, but that's actually really hard because um, 85% of Farcaster usage or Warpcast usage is, is mobile. 88% of Twitter is mobile. I think like 95 or 90% is Instagram is mobile. So consumers spend their time on mobile and, and anyone listening to this who, who follows me at Farcaster knows that I just repeat this all the time, but uh, Reddit is a, not a good mobile product in my view. Like relative to the wealth of information that is on that, that platform, it still feels very stuck in the desktop world which may make sense because they probably relative to other platforms probably have a higher percentage of desktop usage. I'm sure Twitter does relative to Instagram just because like, you know, you have these terminally online people. But I think what's challenging is if you want those like long tail channels to actually have participation, you, you need to actually get users in them. It needs to get in their feeds and uh, they need to be able to peck out an answer pretty quickly on mobile. And so, I think that is the opportunity for us. And so I actually increasingly believe we are more likely to be like competitors with Reddit in, in the long run. Uh, and I don't think Reddit's going anywhere, right? Like they have massive network effect. Their subreddits are huge, but there are a lot of new topics being created in the world at any given point, right? Ethereum didn't exist 10 years ago, or maybe maybe it was just kind of the beginning of it. And so naturally, as, as things pop up, like you compete for that, that home of that new community. And so I kind of like the Stripe analogy where you think that, um, you know, rather than trying to sell into existing enterprises, you're just indexing on the growth of an entire category uh, in that Stripe basically built its business off of like 10 years of YC companies, right? And you get a lift or whatever large company out of that. And then as you level up your um, kind of capabilities, you can go and compete for the Amazons or whatever for the, that payment processing. But, but the margins are actually still better for the small guys. And so 
my my thought is that you know how many net new topics are getting created in any day, week, month, and and having Farcaster compete. And you can think of topics as like companies, brands, yep. um, uh, you know, like effective uh, accelerationism. Yeah, like that didn't exist. Like so, so that kind of happened as a result of Twitter. But you could imagine the next mimetic movement within Silicon Valley has a channel. That city in in Solano County in California, maybe they end up having a channel rather than a subreddit. Right, like so, there are always opportunities to win new new communities that are forming online, and if we can have the right set of features, and and I think the important thing that I do think will become increasingly important over the long term is that you creating a, a channel on Forecaster, you actually, you know, when we properly decentralize it. So there's a caveat there, but we will get there this year. When that happens, you actually retain ownership over your community. So. You have a Discord. You can't really export your Discord. So that's a, that's like basically it's like a tool you use, but like Discord kind of like gets it. Certainly can't do that from Twitter, YouTube. Can't do it from Reddit. And so this idea of like, not that you're doing that on a regular basis, but it's it's the idea that you kind of have insurance against the platform from getting too extractive or shitty. Do, do I right? get there? Was that whole that was that whole like blackout of uh, uh, mods were doing protesting the Reddit changes to the API last summer. Um, in a world where it was on a open protocol, they would have just moved to a different client, right? Or that, you know, they would. So I, I think that world is going to exist. The question is just when. And so if we get right on the timing, then we end up being phenomenally successful. If we're early, then I get to tell people 30 years from now, like, I, I had the same idea. I was just early. And it's like, so. Yeah. Friendster. Now, I, I think we can do a lot to try to manifest that now, right? I, I, I wouldn't be working on it if I didn't believe that. But so much of this is timing. And I, and I just can't imagine 30 years from now, people on the internet who are building valuable communities, not actually having a fundamental ownership of, of that relationship between, you know, the kind of creator, host, curator of the community and, and the community itself. Do, does the, do they get their emails? Where, on Reddit? Or on, on in your in your world, you don't need it on Farcaster because you can just like move to a different client. You can simultaneously use two different uh -huh. clients, and so, um, so you could, yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's some games like if you really wanted to get adversarial and you didn't believe that I was serious, like we could probably cut off access and it would be hard to coordinate. But I think give us like you know the next two or three years, it's only going to get more robust. There will be other clients, and so we will we will kind of be running the the you know the, the Fallout Shelter equivalent experiment at the same time that we have the main one. I mean, here's a good example. So there's a there's an NFT community in Ethereum. Uh, it's called Nouns. And it's it's kind of like gigabrain level people who are thinking about like the future of like on-chain governance and all this other kind of stuff. I always call it, it's like the model UN for, you know, people with like a bunch of Ethereum money. Like that. that's basically what it felt like with Nouns. And they have this massive treasury and uh, they raise a lot of that through the last cycle, and they're they're basically a public goods funding program. And and each you own the NFT, it's got this like specific type of artwork, and then you can go fund public goods. That basically they have this very iconic set of glasses. They call them noggles, like nouns goggles, and uh, it's just kind of a thing, right? They actually were early to Farcaster last year when we launched channels, and so they were kind of like an like a Farcaster native community that had existed on Discord, but they weren't happy with it. And a bunch of them just kind of moved over to Farcaster. And so a lot of like really important conversations within this like relatively large community uh, happen on Farcaster and they have a big treasury. And so what they actually did is they funded or they're in the process of doing this and I think it'll pass uh, three teams for $50,000 uh, to build open source clients that are just focused on their community. And so you can imagine, like, pick pick whatever, like MOZ, like any podcast could go do their own client that like plugs into the Farcaster network. Uh, Nick Superfans could could have one, or you could build a uh, like a sportscaster startup that only didn't care about any of the crypto stuff. It only focused on the team specific channels or the you know the NBA specific channels. And there's a whole bunch of features that they added specifically for NBA fans. That is all going to be possible. I mean, it is possible today, but like increasingly possible with Farcaster. 
And so what I'm optimistic about is if we can just deliver another 10x, another 10x of growth, and we can get to 5 million DAO, uh, you know, daily active users for the protocol, then just like the level of talent and uh, funding, right? Because I think that's an important thing is like, we actually have a lot of talented people, but a lot of them are like, hey, I, I want to work on something where I feel like I can build a business. So the talent plus funding will, will significantly increase. And so I think you'll just see increasingly sophisticated experiences that are tailored to specific interests built yeah. on Farcaster. And, and the nice thing is people will be able to build businesses, which I actually, you know, I'm, anyone who listens to the podcast knows that I'm not a communist, but like my, my view is like, I think public goods have a, a place and, and obviously open source software has gotten the world, you know, way farther ahead uh, because it exists. But I, I think that there is a very healthy relationship between, you know, pub, true public goods, you know, open source stuff, and then people who are, who are, you know, entrepreneurial and commercially minded, right? Because make a good example, uh, Facebook, I don't think gets many, you know, brownie points for most people, uh, who are kind of like hardcore internet people, right? It's like, ah, oh, they're, they're surveilling your data. Like, you know, this is like what my mom uses. I don't use any of that. They release Llama, right? And so like their open source model is like actually a pretty critical part into AI. And so I, I think generally there's a really good feedback loop of having massively commercially successful companies that then contribute further to open source, which, you know, I think pushes us forward. And for those people who want to build businesses, let's just say Sportscaster, like a new, a different client on, on your protocol, what is the, the relationship between them and you in terms of how do you make money from them? And, and yeah, we don't make any money from them. That's the beauty of the protocol. So every user has to pay three dollars to the protocol. Okay, so the protocol will make money. And and right now, I think you could critique and say, well, you effectively control the protocol. I think I've been really clear: is let's get to some amount of scale before we worry about decentralizing control over the protocol. Uh, there's always the ability for people to take the data because it's all open and just like create a competing one. If we were to really be, you know, malicious. But I think if you were to say, it's like, well, who gets to decide uh, where those $3 are going and what they're funding? Right now, we're doing nothing. We're just accumulating in it in like a, like a smart contract. And you know, we'll, we'll figure out at the right point what to do with it. But I think, uh, I think Sportscaster, like if we were just to hypothetically say that and say you want to go build th these like, you know, super clients for super fans. And uh, the way I would think about that is you can tap into this network of people, which roughly 50,000 people are using it every day, maybe a little less. And uh, 200,000 people have signed up. So it's actually a relatively high daily active user to total sign up ratio. Like there's like Dow to Mao, the monthly active user, and then there's total signups. And so uh, it's very engaged. And, and the other interesting thing is every one of the users, by definition, has, a, has an Ethereum wallet. So there's an ability to do transactions and commerce with these people um, that maybe on a regular social network, you can't assume everyone has a credit card. And so what I would say is you would look at that and you'd say, great, maybe there's one community that I could go build on this now. And you can tap into that right away. Like there's no, you don't have to sign any agreement with us. Like you don't have to ask us for API access. Like you can just like, you know that those users, what, what they're interested in. And so you could manually reach out to every one of those users and maybe find your first hundred or thousand users uh, just by being active on the protocol. And as a result, like if you believe that we're going to deliver on 10 and 100x and 1000x growth over the next you know, few years, then you just get to ride like a, another S curve uh, in the same way that mobile app developers took a bet on Apple and like built mobile apps specifically for Apple. And then obviously, yeah. but did, uh, did, as, as you sold more iPhones, more people were able to, you know, use Instagram or WhatsApp and things like that. But let's say I start Sportscaster and create like a Knicks channel and invite all the Knicks fans I know. Does that Knicks channel compete with your channels? Like, are you worried about your clients? No, so, so the, the, the without getting too much in the minutia, that you can access the content that exists in channels now, but the creation of channels right now is centralized. We're just trying to iterate on like, what is the right way? Maybe channels should be paid. Maybe should they be invite only? Should they require you to have some like on-chain asset, whether that's like an NFT or some ticket? Like, I think that we're trying to figure out the right default because I actually think what's important is defaults uh, are, are critical because m when you give people like full ability to do everything, they actually get overwhelmed a lot of times versus if you give them very clear defaults, um, you, and if you know that that works, it can drive a lot of growth. And then naturally people will experiment on the fringes to, to extend. But 
let, let's fast forward like six months from now. Um, there will be an ability for you to just like create any sports channel you want. And then anyone on Warpcast who's using that app would see that content. And then you would be like, oh, I, I should join this. And like, how do I, how do I do, go do it? And then people in that community would be like, oh, you should be using, or maybe you move to D, you know, DM with some of the people. And it's like, oh, are you using you know, Sportscaster? Like, you know, don't use Warpcast for the Knicks stuff. Like, that's fine for like the general crypto stuff. But like, if you're serious about the Knicks, like, whether it's Sportscaster or Knicks-caster, like, you, you can get real specif uh, specificity per client, right? Yeah. Um, like, I can think of like a million different, not a million, but, but a lot of different channels where I would say you could build like a really interesting client. Like sports is very easy because there's a lot of contextual information as it results, uh, relates to games that are going on, but like news and things like that. So you can inject that into the app. It doesn't have to be on the protocol, right? Like you could, you could have a news tab that's just like pulling in stuff from ESPN, the athletic or whatever, that's not like a cast. And so I think that your freedom to innovate in terms of like how, how you'd want to go do that is pretty cool. And it could be its own app, but that just leverages the... Right. And you monetize it. You could have a subscription for that app. You could have your own ads for that app. Because here's the thing, that app might actually be a way more valuable, smaller, but it might be a valuable set of people to advertise to because you know, by definition, if you have Knicks caster, you are interested in the New York Knicks and you're probably in the New York area. Not everyone, but... Right. I, so, so my sense is, like, I have this kind of pet theory that any million person subreddit is a $10 million EBITDA business. So how many million person subreddits? They just, they just filed for their IPO. Like I haven't even had a chance to go through their S1. Like you could probably, and I think that their monetization per user is something like $5. But my thing is if you get the specificity and you don't have, the reason Reddit I think has a, such a hard time monetizing is the thing that they don't want to admit is it's mostly porn. <laughs> like, yes, you have all this like really goldmine content, but like, there's a shit ton of porn on Reddit. And I think that that is, it's like a brand advertiser thing. And obviously, so I think they'll figure it out. It seems like they have a smart team and, and, and they've increased both users and average revenue per user, which is actually quite hard to do. But I think the uh, bear case there is that those mods, like they got to buy into the IPO. So it's like, here, you pay us money as a reward versus like, they should just be making money as a result of, curating a great Knicks channel or a great gardening channel or whatever your topic is. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and so why is that good for you? If all these people, like if, if the protocol only makes $3 per user, talk about the business case for Farcaster in terms of when Farcaster is at scale, how, how are you guys monetizing? Are more people building websites good for Google? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So like my view is Warpcast is, is going to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest app in the space uh, in, in the Farcaster ecosystem for a very long time if we stay very focused on it. So that, that is going to be a meaningful business if we can make it big. Uh, but I think if, in a world where we're just building a social network, it's, it just won't be as big. Like you, won't, you won't attract developers. They'll look at that and they'll, they'll say, I know what happened to Facebook. I know what happened to Twitter. And so the only way you're able to, to do that is if you actually deliver on the decentralization. Right, and it exists for a long time, and you don't mess that up. And yeah. so, but, you know, we had we had a blow up two weeks ago, where I I was moving quickly through all that growth, and we have a very clear no squatting policy for usernames for channels. Right, like channels have like a URL, so you can think it was like warpcast.com slash NBA or whatever. Um, and someone had registered a bunch of names. Uh, and I basically was going back and forth with them. I ultimately made the call that they were squatting. I took the names. And I think there's, you know, it's always good to get a public flogging in terms of like, especially if you're building a protocol, but it got kind of portrayed on Twitter in a way where it, it's like Farcaster claims to be decentralized, but it's not. So first, channels have, have been really clear. They're not decentralized yet. Uh, but I think it, it's, it's showing you that in a world where you've had a lot more growth, people are expecting more out of you to say maybe that coming soon worked when you were smaller, but when you're bigger, like you actually have to just deliver on that stuff a lot sooner. And so I think the, the challenge with Farcaster will be is the best way to grow the network, I think for the foreseeable future is to continue to have Warpcast, our app, 
be this really easy onboarding experience. I've been using this like mullet term, right? It's like web two in the front, web three in the back, in the sense that when you sign up for WorkCast, it should just feel on par with a major social media client. But in that world, that means WarpCast, this app, which is built on top of Farcaster, is, is continuing to have a lot of influence and power, right? And I would, I would look at outside looking in and I would say, okay, in that world, then basically you have to underwrite, do you believe that the WarpCast guys, Dan and Varun, um, actually want to build the protocol? And so I think where we've made a lot of progress over the last few years is we've earned the trust of a lot of early Farcaster users because we said, hey, this is how we're building protocol. We're building it product-led protocol, like in the sense that we have Warpcast. We're going to kind of move quickly. We're going to make these kind of pragmatic decisions and we're going to optimize for user growth at the, at the expense of like ideological decentralization um, and moving a little slower, but like more pure on that side of things. Uh, and I think that has worked, and I think we will continue to do that, but I think we may have to modulate a little bit, um, just given that in order for us to continue to have the, the, the correct branding for developers, that this is a protocol that you can't be rugged, like we, we have to just make sure that anything interesting within the protocol is, is decentralized in a reasonable amount of time. And I think we probably have less time than I would have said you know, in January for channels, like we, we have to figure something out sooner. And, and so that will be the thing. And then, so in terms of the business model, I think like if we deliver a hundred X growth from here and we have 5 million people using the protocol, what will happen is there will just be a bunch of people who don't care like, Oh, well, what, what happens if Warpcast rugs me? It's like, there are 5 million people that I can actually go after and build like a client. I already know that they're using it. I can plug into this data right away. There's no ghost town. And so that is, I actually think, the most compelling thing to offer people. And I also know that, like, personally, like, the goal is to have a protocol, right? I want to be able to look back 30 years from now and say, yes, I built one of the most important internet protocols. Like, that, that is the, yeah. the post-Coinbase IPO version of, like, what I actually want to build in the world. I don't want to build a, a centralized social network. And right. so as long as I'm working on it and, and Varun is working on it, I, I feel pretty confident that we're not going to mess that up but i don't think that, that gets you that far like you have to deliver on building trust with people like your words only go so far you need the actions and and so if farcaster is a protocol it's, does that mean that it's a token or, or what is sort of the, the actual monetization model at, at scale so i well so farcaster has a monetization model right now you pay three dollars to use the protocal so right, but what, what is sort of the scale if you had if you had 50 million people using it there would be 150 million dollars coming in per year to the protocol and then we need to figure out what to do with it Right. So there's very likely a an independent entity that is like actually managing the protocol. But if you all of a sudden give a fifty million, hundred fifty million dollar budget to a bunch of people that if you actually want it to be independent, you better hope that those people are the same alignment in terms of like what you want for the protocol. So I, I think like problem to solve when we're a lot bigger in my view, versus like trying to prematurely solve it, uh is it, we're just gonna move way slower and then like yeah. But I think there's a version of the world where I think like Elon, what he's doing with uh, creator rewards, I think is brilliant. I mean, obviously YouTube has been doing this for a long time. Substack has this model. It's more of a tool. But my view is like, there is a very straightforward way if this revenue gets to be meaningful enough that we can reward the people, both the creators, like, I, I kind of hate that word, but it's, it's, it's like, it is the okay. word that we use. It's like we call an iPhone a phone. And obviously that's just an app on the phone. But I think people who are adding, I, I have this term conversational liquidity, right? Like, so in DeFi in crypto, they have this thing, TVL, total value lock. And if you think about it, it's just like you're trying to add value from a liquidity standpoint, that's how you build a financial market. In a social market, you need a number of people who are showing up every day. And then more importantly, you actually need people putting interesting stuff that will actually keep people coming back. And so if you can actually analyze that in a way that's transparent and open. And I mean, Google obviously has done this for the web for a long time. Maybe you could argue that it's gotten worse over time, but page rank is in, in theory is a way to do that, where it's you, you weight the quality of a web page by the quality of the web pages that link to it. And then that's kind of a recursive thing. And so you could imagine a world where some percentage of whatever is coming to the protocol is actually 
being paid out directly. So you don't need another token. There's, there's value there. But like, we're talking about a protocol that has 200,000 signups. We don't even know if people are going to pay for another year yet. Like, you'd be idiotic to be worried about like, how, how does that carve up now? It's like, no, the focus should be growing the protocol now. And then we have a huge uh, number of people we gave a free year to in October of next, this year who are going to show us what our churn rate is. Because if our churn rate is 80%, we don't actually have anything like to be like, we need to like focus on, on retention. And so I think there's just like a lot of dumb stuff in crypto where people, it's like fake work. They like basically do all this stuff. They create a financial, financialized ecosystem way premature of, of, of actually delivering any amount of value. Whereas contrast that to normal startups and normal startups, they stay private probably maybe arguably too long, but it's like seven years on the early side, 10 years, probably more. And then you have a liquidity event and then you have a ton of building in the public market. But you have a clear business model, at least when you do that. Ignore, ignore all the SPACs, put those to the side. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, Airbnb, like, or, or yeah, hell, even Meta, right? Like Meta was public for X number of years doing really well. And then Zuck decided to start spending a bunch of money on the metaverse which now actually looks pretty smart with this Vision Pro, like you know, easy to trash him. And now it's like maybe actually being in the arena there for multiple years before and, and spending the money is, is good. Maybe it wasn't the most efficient. But like he got hammered in the public markets, even in a stock, he, he has super voting control like because the cost structure was too bad. And so I think like important things and, and, and enduring things you need to, just like iteratively build them one step at a time and any amount of like uh trying to like pull gratification forward because it you know that's what other people do is just that's just stupid cargo culting it's just like be independent in your thinking and it's like get to a point where someone can objectively look at that and go yes there is actually something that is durable sustained value and so that is i think the challenge for the forecaster protocol and if you can actually do that at the Farcaster protocol level, I'm not worried about building like a, a meaningful business or webcast. That just means like you, you actually accomplished what you wanted in terms of the total amount. Of right. The goal is to have a billion people using Farcaster through some version of an app. Right. That is a very long ways away, especially in a world where you think you can go charge for it. Right. That that may may not scale. But got it. Meta Meta has three billion. Right. Twitter so, Twitter is in the hundreds of millions. So so, so like. We're, we're ways away, but right. I don't know, work on things. I, I think one of the things that I was really inspired when I was off between Coinbase and, and starting to work on Farcaster is Elon, and this is before his you know, most recent biography, but just the idea to be working on projects that took 20 years, yeah. right? Like he's really only hitting his stride with SpaceX and Tesla in the last few years. And the easiest uh, like way to look at that is they have that, I don't, I don't know how to, you'd find it. There's the, the the video showing how often SpaceX has shot a rocket up. And like, it, it's like one every like couple, you know, like years. And then it's like every couple of months. And then it gets to the point where they're shooting them off every, you know, five days or four days now. They, they're shooting two off at the same time. And so the amount of time that takes to just like go through that, like the near-death experiences, um, I mean, crypto itself is, is, is what, 15 years old, if, if, you know, more or less with Bitcoin. So we're not, even a, we're not even a full SpaceX yet on crypto. And people, you know, uh, Farcaster is three years old. So I, I, I like long time horizons are underrated. And I think few people can actually do it because one, there's an economic pressure to take the shortcut, right? And in, in the case, you know, for myself and Varun, we, we don't have that. And I think that is important because we're going to stick it through the good times and the bad. Like that, that, like very easy to quit 2022, 2023, if you're kind of wanting to have an exit on a pretty fast time frame because you need to go buy your first house. Right. And I don't blame people on that. But like long time horizon startups are rare. Uh, Usually because like people haven't had economic success yet. Like look at the ones that have. Elon had massive economic success. And then the other one everyone's holding up is Sam Altman. It's like, yeah, a lot yeah. of economic success going into open AI. And that took a long time. Right. Right. 
Like, you know, they're, they're, they they went to the fastest, probably to like a billion or two billion in ARR, but it was like, yeah, but if you take it out over the course of the history of the company, there are probably SaaS companies that have actually gone faster. Um, but it's just, you know, when you, when you take that long time horizon, you also just don't have that many competitors because um, they'll compete with you in the market that you're in today. But if you can actually extend it out and you continue to stay focused and deliver and, you know, don't overspend and hire and all that other kind of stuff, I think. I think you you get to a place where um, you have to simultaneously have urgency, but at the same time, like vision. And yeah. I'm not claiming to have that as much as I think I just have high high tolerance for being stubborn on it and just just sticking it out. Right. Right. So the goal is to get a billion users on the protocol. You'll make at least three dollars each from them, and maybe you'll figure out other ways to make more from them over time. So yeah, to be clear, that three dollars is not mine. That is the protocol, and. Yes. Uh, the, the perk of having kind of created it is my team gets to decide what is the structure that we actually figure out how to, on a long-term basis is ignore, ignore the stuff that's happening now. Like if this thing is successful and you have a billion people using it, that's, that's $3 billion a year. And like, that's, that's, that's real money. And like figuring out like, okay, who gets control of that? So Bitcoin has a very easy model, right? Like Bitcoin has proof of work. So it's very easy to show like, okay, and you can't game it. So you do the work. To, to mine the block and, and secure the network, you get paid. No one else gets paid. That, that's, like a, that's a very simple economic model in the scheme of things. Ethereum is a little bit more sophisticated and says, we had this proof of work mechanism. We shifted over to this thing where we just take the people who have a bunch of ETH, so people who are the most incentivized in kind of making this thing work, allow them to, to stick it. And then, uh, you know, they, they, in theory, or they can have someone do it for them, do work to secure the network. Right. We don't have that mechanism for broadcast. So we have a model of people pay to get in, but how do you fairly distribute? Like that is an unsolved problem. And so my view is don't solve it prematurely, like try to actually get a thousand X growth from here. And maybe at that point, you have 50 million people using it every day. You have a very clear understanding of where's the value being driven in the protocol over multiple years. How do you measure long-term retention of users? All that jazz. Right. And, and so I, I hear that. And so is this a, a company that goes public someday? Or is this like a, a crypto network that is valued like other crypto networks? Far, Farcaster, Farcaster doesn't go public. It's a protocol. It's like saying, does email go public, right? Um, right? The company Warpcast, I would like to take public if it was big enough. Sure, why not? That, that would be a, a major achievement. But and, that's, like a, so, that's a really hard thing because zero interest rates went away. And all of a sudden you have to be valued within like a band of like your, your comps are what is meta valued at? What, look, at, look at how poorly Snap does in the public markets. And Snap has like what, 400 million users, like insane usage. But yeah. and so if you you're know, looking- I, I said on the podcast, which I'm now going to use more often, reality has high standards. Public yeah. markets are reality, right? Like, yeah, they can get distorted every so often, but right now they have, they have like a pretty sober take on most companies, maybe NVIDIA puts it aside, but. I think, um, you know, like excellent in, in social media, that those are your peers, is, is Meta. And they make $200 per user per year in the US. Yeah. So if you're not close to that, then you're not going to be valued at the same thing as Meta. And so, like, good luck, uh, you know, being a public company. So there's a, sh- you know, a lot of work to do right. between now and then. But, I mean, that's the fun of it. And so if, if someone here is listening to this podcast, and looking to join Farcaster, uh, you have a very lean team, and you're all you're all technical. Um, but if if someone were to have that bar, and they're thinking about sort of the economic upside, is it the combination of Warpcast and how it does as a as a as a company, and some value of the protocol then goes back to that? Or how should the equity we, hold? We we the way we pitch it is we have equity in Warpcast or Merkle Manufacturer is the name of the company. That's what we pitch, and we say my that that, that is the. That is the value I can guarantee you because I can't guarantee you value from a protocol that in, 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 in a good case, I am not in control of like that. That is the, that is the long-term goal with, with Farcaster. And so you have to have the intellectual honesty to say, you're going to want to make the best decision for Farcaster in, in the future. Right. And so I think where I just focus it is like, there's a path in my view is if Warpcast keeps driving growth for Farcaster, then 
we have a meaningful number of people using the app and we can come up with ways to make money. And I think that there are ways that you can make money that don't involve ads. Um, maybe you have an ads model that people can opt into. So they get a free version or a cheap version, right? Like $3. Uh, we have a other co-host on this podcast who would love to tell me that there is a version of the world where you do not have to charge the protocol fee. I still think you would get plenty of spam, but there's probably a version at some point when that makes sense to figure out. It's like, you want the free version, you get it with ads. And then I think there's the paid version, which is what I would like to build, whether that's subscription or... Um, I, I think the other thing that's powerful about frames is like there's commerce happening in the feed as a result of these links that can initiate crypto transactions. So there's a version of the world. And I actually think Elon and Twitter are headed in this direction. So Elon has money transmitter licenses um, that he's getting in all these states. And for those who don't know, in the US, you have to have a license from every US state in order to do any money movement, right? To be a PayPal, to be a cash app, to be Coinbase you have to actually go get state level licenses outside of going and getting a federal bank charter, which doesn't happen. Uh, so as a result, he's, he's going to do this. So this is like public. You, you can actually see who has them. And he's indicated that he wants to build the everything app. So you can imagine everything you want to do is going to exist. I mean, there was a tweet this week saying X mail is coming, right? It's like, I think his version of the world is go try to speed run building Google like in terms of like a full ecosystem of products that are all kind of tied and rather than a um you know search engine that is on top of the web it's it's kind of a an integrated experience on top of the global internet public square and you know grok has access privilege access to the uh you know tweet graph in terms of like its ability and i don't know when i want breaking news summary i go to grok like no other app can do that. Even perplexity can't like do that well because it just gets the full firehose of Twitter. I imagine it'll get better. And then I think that they're going to be able to do a bunch of like commerce related stuff. I also think Elon is is a rare person because he has such a big platform that he can really get into a big fight with Apple and Google uh, and maybe even win, right? He's not Tim Sweeney and he's not Zuck. He's, he, he's, he's on a different level. So I think, you know, I, I, I view Twitter as like the single biggest threat to Farcaster in the sense that I just think if they continue to improve the product, the the stuff for Farcaster, while more creative freedom because it is an open protocol, it just it'll it'll go from the ability to have it be a 10x improvement in terms of certain dimensions to some percent. And we know from Peter Thiel, it's like if you're if you're dealing in percent better, it's not going to cut it. You need to be X better, and and so. My my view is like we just have to move with a ton of urgency. Uh, and look, there's a ton of areas where Twitter could go down the wrong path. You can get bored with it. Like, but um, in terms of like when I look at people in the space, like the, the the company that I think of like is the the most likely to build the the right set of features that will make our stuff seem less exciting. It will be Twitter. And I don't think Twitter is looking at Farcaster. Maybe they are, but I, I, I doubt it. Um, so I think it's ours in terms of just that like, we just need to move really, really quickly. Um, and that a lot of that comes out as just focus, right? So we have a small team hiring more people doesn't actually make us go quickly. It's just like knowing what is the right sequence of things to work on. Um, that ultimately leads to the most amount of growth for, for the protocol. Yeah. You said earlier that Google is happy when there are more web pages because of course it improves their core product, which is indexing the internet, but they're probably less happy when there's a duck, duck, go, or some company website that is actually a competitor to, to their taking away traffic, which is all to say that if someone's trying to build a, a Reddit or Twitter competitor more broadly, should they be building it on Farcaster or is that, would that not make sense because it's somewhat competitive to work out? Yeah. So the way to think about it is Warpcast feels very much like Twitter today, increasingly less channels is one example and frames is another, but if you want the, 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 the critique, it's, it's, it, it looks very similar to Twitter, like a lot of the same patterns, right? And, and you could argue, well, Mastodon does too, Threads does. Like, so it is a short text feed-based product, okay? Um, if you're trying to go build another version of that, I don't think that there's going to be much of a market for more than you know, a handful. Like there's one supercast. That is a one that is designed for pro users, like in terms of like kind of more like tweet deck in that it's just naturally going to uh, appeal to people who you know want scheduled scheduled posts and all this other kind of power user stuff that in a world where we need to stay focused on 
driving a thousand X growth for the protocol, like we shouldn't be working on that at Wogas. So I'm super happy that uh, his name's Woj. He's, he's working on, on Supercast. Do we need five other Supercasts as, as like independent businesses? Probably not. I mean, there's probably space for like an open source client that like kind of like community driven, people can kind of modify it any way they want, makes it really easy. If you want to like run your own hub and be like totally cypherpunk, you can go do that. I think that would be great. I think where there is much more opportunity with Farcaster and, and, and is less competitive uh, in terms of like with Warpcast directly uh, is just apps that use the social graph and just are completely different, right? So super simple example. We have video on, on, on Warpcast. It's very basic. You could go build TikTok and just like filter out every post that doesn't have video and just like make it like amazing. You could do the same thing with images. So someone could actually go spin up Instagram and, and TikTok very quickly. And they don't even have to get anyone to do any content. You just do a better job of rendering it. And to the degree that you start to add features there um, that either attract users because it's better monetization as a creator or it's just better user experience. And, and as the Farcaster network grows, like you naturally get the people who are just like dedicated video people. Like I know the, I know the perfect podcast or the perfect client for you, Eric, would be the podcaster client, which you, the caster get like, that's kind of stupid. But anyways, a podcast client that just like gave you an endless stream of like interesting podcasts that were weighted by the social network. You, you, you would just like, you'd have it in your ear all the time at berries and all this other kind of stuff. Like, so. My view is like be be excellent in a specific domain rather than trying to kind of take the the like mall approach, which is what we are, right? We are the the like mall. Like you need to actually be a, a specialty store, which can also end up being a big business. Um, but I think it's going to be hard to beat us at the mall in the near term. Now, if the protocol gets enough users, you're going to have big big players potentially show up, right? So let's say we. We're phenomenally successful and we 10,000 X the number of daily active users. And so all of a sudden we have 50 million or 500 million people using it. I bet you Meta would show up and say like, oh, okay, like we, we can actually extract a ton of value here. We have our own proprietary graph. We don't have to give anything back. And so I think it just, the order of magnitude is going to attract a different type of, of builder. And the bigger the potential market, the more funding will be available. And so... I would imagine at the 5 million or 50 million daily active user mark, you're going to have a well-funded team that is going to have better design, better performance. Like, you know, and I, my team is excellent, but my team has a lot of stuff that's going on and we're pretty small. And so I think, I think that's completely feasible. But the thing is, you're only going to track that level of capital plus talent in a world where the, the total addressable market, the total number of Farcaster users is sufficient. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. One thing you focused on is Retention. You got, you got to get a no retention. There, there, some people say that Clubhouse sort of fizzled out once it opened up because it, it took this incredible community and it morphed it and it, it had too much noise, basically, once they opened up. Is that the correct eulogy for, for Clubhouse? Is that the correct diagnosis for why th things fizzled? What's your Clubhouse diagnosis? And then also, how do you make sure that doesn't happen here, where as you grow significantly quickly, it doesn't um, scale the noise as well. Yeah. So let, let me take the second part of the question. My focus right now is quality, like in terms of feed quality. And it's like, whether that's in channels or main feed, um, we've, we've been heads down on that for the last two weeks. Uh, somewhat slow progress. We had like a couple of quick wins, a couple of things we tried that didn't work, but ultimately building the most relevant feed for you, uh, that that's, that's critical. Uh, I think Going to Clubhouse, the if I could, and I hate eulogy because they're they're still working on it. Um, and and to count out an entrepreneur who is able to build something that even for a moment gets that much usage and and kind of creates a moment like that, I think is is dumb. But I think what I would say is one, and I mean we were there at the beginning, right? It it is a COVID driven thing. There were a bunch of businesses during COVID that had juiced numbers as a result, right? Peloton. Like, so I think that is very hard to separate is, is the behaviors that had a, happened as a result of a world that was pretty shut down in 2020. Um, and I think the, the second thing for Clubhouse, so, so one, it's, it's something outside of their control. It's like you live and die by this like weird 
Black Swan event. And then I think the two, Twitter ended up shipping spaces. And the backstory I got here was that Twitter, in their kind of like ineptitude during the period pre-Elon, just so happened to be refactoring their um, like core audio video streaming for Periscope, a company that they had acquired. So classic sign that you don't know what you actually work on is you refactor. Like, it's just like, what? Like, the, the, you know, Twitter, Twitter had so many things they could be working on uh, and, and they were refactoring audio video. For a product that wasn't, wasn't winning, right? Like Instagram and TikTok, like just totally winning from a video standpoint. Um, so they were, happened to be doing that. And then Clubhouse happened. The other inside baseball is I think there was a very close deal potentially at some point that Twitter was going to buy Clubhouse. Four billion, um, I think, or something like that. Whatever. So it's a scuttlebutt, right? But I think, so Twitter kind of like looks at this and says, hey, this is actually like kind of very aligned to our type of product. If you think about the types of people who were using Clubhouse, they were the types of people that were kind of like more indexed to Twitter than even an Instagram or something else. And I think it's a rare instance where and maybe not rare. I think actually social is a category where, where you have to be careful that your app being a feature doesn't get cloned by someone else with at scale distribution and, and daily habit built in. And I think in this case, because Twitter had, had this brand new infrastructure to be able to handle the underlying protocol there is WebRTC, they were able to move somewhat quickly. If, if Twitter was starting from scratch and they had like taken a year's ship, maybe, maybe Clubhouse would have actually kind of gotten to a place. They didn't have an Android app for a while. Like, there's like a bunch of, of stuff um, that they, they kind of went into hyperscale without a team. Like they were building a team out and a whole other app platform um, and web, which they never really got to um, while, while they had all this insane growth. And then they had a trust and safety issue, which is that is that's something that keeps me up at night for, you know, Farcaster and Warpcast. But I think one of the perks of the protocol is I can just, I can nerf something that is even marginal um, on Warpcast. People might not like it. The reality is, I think we generally seem to have a good gut. Go uh, and when I mean nerf, I just basically just don't show your stuff on Warpcast. So it exists at the protocol, so you can go build another client. But I think that has had an, uh, a useful impact for us is that we haven't really run into this issue because one, it costs money to sign up. And then two, uh, you can just basically say, hey, you can continue to use the Farcaster protocol, use a different client. Uh, and so that that is a cocktail of like you have a competitor copying your feature with more distribution. You have all this COVID fueled growth and then you have this huge trust and safety issue uh, that probably was overblown by the media. We, we kind of know the person who, who perpetuated it, the unfettered conversations. Um, but if you if you end up having to like spend your time like solving trust and safety rather than getting your Android app out and, and, and new features. Like trust and safety is not going to, to build you product market fit. It will keep you in product market fit, right? And yeah. so that, that is a, if you can avoid that for a long time, um, for whatever reasons, the, the initial seed community, the, the complexity of your app, the ability for you to actually moderate and then kind of be fine with it because you say, hey, it's a protocol. Uh, those pragmatic set of trade-offs I mean, arguably, Blue Sky ran into this issue as well, right? And so they spent a lot of time last year when they kind of had the the moment working on trust and safety features. Ours are very simple. It's just like if you're if you're not following the terms of service, we just nerf you. Then you disappear on Warpcast. Yep. So you have freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. Right. And and is that perfect? No. And will we have to evolve it over time? Yes. Will we have to have team people working on this? Yes. But at this scale, we we don't have that issue. But I think that that that's what I would say is. With public-based social networks, whether that is audio, video, or here's another basic example. We launched video. We, we rolled it out to people who had been using the platform for a really long time, so high trust people, and we've been slowly adding other people. We could have very easily added video and just said, anyone can upload. DMCA notices, pornographic content, like we would have just spent some of this time moderating. And the reality is the people who, yes, is there a little friction to get video and are we missing out on some of those posts? But at the same time, when you kind of like don't rush everything for growth all the time, and not to say that Clubhouse did that, I mean, it's like the core part of their protocol. Yeah. But I think this is hindsight 2020 is like, I can look at how these companies work and then say, okay, how do we avoid that? Or how do we take a pragmatic approach that says, 
yes, this may happen, but like, wh what tools do we have? So we actually added Nerf, like this ability to kind of like hide you from Warpcast pre preemptively. It's one of the few preemptive features we did because we said this one feature can allow us to actually get pretty far based on, on these types of issues. Because if you don't see it on Warpcast and you use Warpcast, then, then you're not going to have an issue with it. And from a protocol standpoint, I, I can make a credible argument because the protocol is decentralized at the core level that you can go use another client and you're free to do it. And you can get the people who if you're spewing vitriol or whatever, you can get them to use your, you know, your deplorable client, whatever. That's, that's fine. That's the way the internet works. And so that, that is one of the perks, I think, of like protocol-based social networks, but you have to actually have the protocol work, right? Blue Sky ran into their, their moderation issue, but it was just a server. And so it turned into this whole thing. It's like, well, they couldn't deplatform people because they didn't have the, the protocol work. So I actually think they get into a much easier world for, for this stuff that they're working in the trust and safety if, if they could have said, hey, you can go to this other server and then our users don't see it. Yep. The, and it's, it's interesting. And it's your point, what the Clubhouse team achieved is, is incredibly impressive. One of the great all-time lightning in a bottle moments. And uh, you know we're friends with, with the team and, and, and they're great. I do wonder if they had not opened it up if we would still be using it today, like if that magic community would have would have stayed, of course, then it wouldn't be a venture backed business, right? But it would be a, a mid sized social network, which I think is lost in today's internet because there's like no business incentive for it to exist. We either have group chats of like thirty people or or websites that try to hit every everybody in the world, and there's but, no but that. That's the point of Farcaster is a mid sized social network can exist and it can coexist alongside all of the others because the the graph and the core layer. Uh, of, of an account and, and how you interact, that's all done for you. And so someone who's <laughs> on Warpcast might be saying, hey, now that Warpcast is 50K DAU, I really missed it when it was 5,000 or 500. And I want to create this other one that just sort is only for these people. They could do that kind of like this exclusive network only for first 1,000 people of Farcaster or something? Or Warpcast? Sure. If you think that those people are the best thousand people, I don't actually think that's true. I love the first thousand people. Actually, a lot of yeah. the first thousand people. Or, or whoever the thousand people they first want. First 20,000. How about that? Sure. There are a lot of great people. A lot of people that I've met. I mean, most yeah. of the people that I interact with Farcaster on a daily basis, I, I didn't know before. So great, great group of people. But I think it is, is misguided to think that like that group of people is the special group of people in the internet. No, there are other special group of people who are going to show up and and assimilate and, and that will be great, right? It's, okay. it's actually, think of it as like an immigration policy. That would be like saying like, mm, we shouldn't allow anyone else into the country. Right. So if you're one of those early Farcaster users who yearns for that day, you basically are an anti-immigration uh, yeah. person. So, no, <laughs> yes. but, but I think the, the, the thing I would always push on this, and, and it's become a bit of a meme on Farcaster, is I just basically say, that's a great idea for another client. And, and the kids say, um, I think usually with this is skill issue. Like you can build it if you're able to build it. And GPT like has made that even easier. But like when you want something in the world now with Farcaster, you have the ability to be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and yes, it may require a bunch of work, but if you're passionate enough, and, and this is the nouns example that I brought up before, that's a community of people that have funding, right? Their own budget. But they're saying, hey, we want to go build three attempts at different clients that are more uh, tailored to our community. Great. Like that, that is, that's why I'm working on this. Like I, I want to see 10,000 different apps and some will be big businesses and some will be passion projects with 10 people using it. And that's completely fine because the system is permissionless like the internet. And th that, is the, that is the thing I will be happy about having created is the, the new substrate for which anyone can go create whatever size social network that they think is interesting. And it doesn't have to just be big. So Farcaster does the work of getting to the big number and then everyone else can decide what game they want to play. Yeah. That might be a good place to, 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 to wrap. Uh, or, or unless any closing thoughts on, on Farcaster or anything we didn't yet get to, get to discuss about, uh, you know, sort of the progress you made or what, what's to come? Yeah. I mean, I'm literally going to go work on product specs right after this. So Excellent. Perfect. Uh, back to work. A great place to wrap. Uh, Dan, uh, thanks as always. And, and until next time.